Welcome to this next lesson. We're going to take a look at some future scenarios now. One of the sticky challenges in looking forward into the future and projecting the range of possible outcomes for climate is that we don't really know what we're going to do in terms of our emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So people have made efforts to describe a range of likely possibilities. It's not that any particular one of the possibilities is going to become the future, nor is one possibility necessarily more likely than the others, but defining a range allows us to think about what that future world might look like and which of the future possibilities comes closest to how we imagine we'd like the future to look. So we're going to talk about emissions scenarios. Emission scenarios essentially define some pathway for human emissions of greenhouse gases over time. Then that information is fed into climate models, which then can calculate things like future global temperatures or future sea level or precipitation patterns at different times in the future based on those hypothetical future emissions. We're going to talk about two approaches to emission scenarios here. One approach is from the Special Report on Emission Scenarios from 2000. And the other is called representative concentration pathways, which are a newer approach. Here's the approach used by the special report on emission scenarios, which were utilized in the IPCC's third and fourth assessment reports. Essentially, groups of people sat down and defined some future storylines. The storylines were based on possible socioeconomic change in the future, like whether the world's economies would become more integrated over time, or whether regions would become more economically isolated. They included factors like demographics and possible changes in human populations, in resource use, in the mix of energy types that we might use in the future, possible policy changes, a huge range of human factors. Then, taking these storylines, people estimated what the implications would be for future greenhouse gas emissions for each story. And in this way, they defined emission scenarios that were linked to the storylines. These estimates of emissions then were fed into the climate models. This is a simplified schematic of the SRES families. The two on the top, A1 and A2, thematically tend toward more economic growth in their storylines. And the two on the bottom, B1 and B2, tend more toward environmental protection. The two on the left, A1 and B1, describe worlds that are more globally interconnected. And the two on the right describe futures where regional connections are more important. Within the A1 family, there are three scenarios that differ in how we use energy in the future. One of them represents a balance between fossil and non-fossil energy. Then there's A1F1, which describes a future with intensive use of fossil fuels. This one is typically nicknamed the business as usual scenario. And there's T, in which we transition to non-fossil energy sources. There are no probabilities nor preferences attached to any of the scenarios. The attempt is to capture a range of possibilities and use them to learn about what the future might hold. Here's an example of some output from climate models using a selection of the SRES scenarios from the IPCC 2007 report. The vertical axis is warming relative to the global average from 1980 to 1999. And in the time period between 2000 and 2100, you can see that the various scenarios might take us on different temperature paths. There's quite a lot of information on this plot. The red, green, and blue are three different scenarios, and the lighter shaded colors around each line are a range of outcomes for each scenario from a bunch of different climate models. The yellow is actually a hypothetical story in which greenhouse gas concentrations are held constant at the values they had in the year 2000. On the right are the outcomes in the year 2100 for the three scenarios shown on the plot, plus three more scenarios, including the business as usual one, which is on the far right. It's the one of these six that ends up at the highest temperatures. Again, scenarios like these help us think about and imagine the future possibilities. And again, none of the scenarios are officially more likely than any others. Though as time goes on, we'll be able to assess which turns out to be closer to our true path. Here's another newer approach to defining emission scenarios. In this approach, what people have done is they've defined a condition for Earth in the year 2100. And that condition is defined by how much extra energy might be added to the climate system by 2100 compared to pre-industrial values. And then after picking four endpoints, people chose what are called representative concentration pathways to get there. 
The concentration part relates to the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere along the way. There are, in fact, many possible pathways, many possible arrangements of social and economic and political futures that might carry us to those conditions defined for 2100. So this approach is somewhat reversed from the SRES approach. Rather than defining the stories first, then the implications for greenhouse gases, this approach defines the greenhouse gas trajectories. Then people talk about what variety of human scenarios might correspond to those trajectories. There's an ongoing exchange of information about concentration pathways and what human choices might correspond to them. So to get an idea about these RCPs, they are four trajectories into the future. The trajectories include radiative forcing from a bunch of different sources, including predicted solar output, every one of the different gases in the atmosphere involved in energy flows, aerosols, land use change, black carbon on snow, a lot of different factors. What's plotted here is the radiative forcing from greenhouse gas emissions in watts per meter squared. The black line is the historical data since 1900, and then each of the colored lines goes along a representative concentration pathway. The top one is named RCP 8.5, because if you follow that pathway, by 2100, we end up with radiative forcing 8.5 watts per meter squared higher than we had prior to the Industrial Revolution. The second one down, the orange one, RCP 6, a pathway by which we'd end up with 6 watts per meter squared, more than pre-industrial. Then there's RCP 4.5, and at the bottom, there's RCP 3 PD, which is the only one that peaks before 2100 and then declines. That's the PD for peak and decline. So what kinds of emissions each year would carry us along those pathways? Here are the representative annual emissions for each of the four pathways in units of gigatons, that's billions of tons, of carbon per year. We're somewhere near 10 billion tons per year now. RCP 8.5 takes us up close to 30 billion tons of carbon each year. The other three pathways show declines in emission rates starting prior to 2100 with RCP3PD starting to decline quite soon, with emissions going negative by 2100. Again, these are simply illustrative possible choices of action that we might take. And next, how do those emissions translate into atmospheric CO2 concentrations? We not only have to take into account our inflow via emissions, but we also need to incorporate things like how much carbon land plants in the oceans will continue to take out of the atmosphere each year. For RCP3PD, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide actually decline by 2100. And for RCP4.5, they stabilize at about 540 parts per million shortly after 2100. 540 is just a tad shy of doubling CO2 since pre-industrial times. Going up, RCP6 takes us past 700 parts per million and RCP 8.5 keeps rising for the next couple of hundred years. But keep in mind as we look at the next plot that stabilizing CO2 doesn't translate into stabilizing temperature because for temperature to stabilize, we need to balance inflows and outflows of energy. So the RCPs get defined and the pathways get fed into a climate model to see what happens. For example, what happens to global surface warming. This particular example uses a climate sensitivity of 3 degrees Celsius per doubling of CO2, which is the same as what we've been using, just expressed differently. In just one of the scenarios, that's RCP3PD, temperature stabilizes by 2100, and other research shows that beyond that, into the future, temperatures decline along that pathway. RCP3PD is also the only one of these representative concentration pathways in which global temperatures don't exceed 2 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial values, which is an often discussed boundary that's likely undesirable to cross. In the other three scenarios, temperatures continue to rise for longer. To summarize, we have a desire to peer into the future. Climate models can help us do that, but they need information about possible pathways for future emissions. We've described two approaches to defining those scenarios. The SRES families of scenarios start by telling a story about future human activities and what our societies might look like. From those stories, people estimate what the scenarios would likely mean for greenhouse gas emissions, 
and those numbers are used in climate models. The representative concentration pathway approach is different. First, it defines endpoints in terms of the radiative forcing above pre-industrial times that might be happening in 2100. Then it works backward to define representative pathways that lead there. Again, those pieces of information go into climate models in order to estimate the response of the climate system to our actions. How does this help? What these scenarios do is give us glimpses and what-if scenarios. What can we expect if we approximately follow one pathway or another? They can also help us think about what we imagine we'd like to see in our future world.